Hello, everybody. Welcome to Jaffrey Bible Church. A couple of you are sitting a little too close to the screen. So if you just back up, remember six feet. Thank you. I'm George Slyman. I'm one of the elders here at Jaffrey Bible Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday service for April 5th. We're excited that you're with us this morning, and we look forward to a blessed time together as we worship the Lord through music, ministry update, communion, and teaching God's Word. You know, we are separated by distance, but we are united as a church body. And uh, in the midst of this unprecedented coronavirus epidemic, we as Christians keep turning to the Lord. As King David wrote in Psalm 59, verses 16 through 17, he said, But as for me, I shall sing of your strength. Yes, I shall joyfully sing of your loving kindness in the morning. For you have been my stronghold and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for God is my stronghold, the God who shows me loving kindness. We'll continue to praise, uh, praise God this morning, uh, who is our stronghold and who shows his loving kindness. As we open our service with prayer, we're going to pray for the country of Zimbabwe, and then we'll be followed by a brief update from the kitchen team. So let's open in prayer, uh, if you would, with me. Lord, we ask for your blessing on, on the service. We thank you for uh, your blessing on this nation and this world, Lord. We pray for the uh, continued concerns around the globe. We pray for the service today. We pray for the country of Zimbabwe. Lord, we pray for increased health care, for the preventative education, for an HIV and AIDS ravaged nation. We pray for the unity, cooperation, and additional resources for the Christian care organizations that are there. We pray for a moral and visionary government to rebuild that impoverished nation. Now, I'm gonna bring up the kitchen team for an update. Hi, I will be presenting the kitchen team ministry. Uh, my name is Myona Taylor, and I am the ministry lead here at Jeffrey Bible. I'm just going to give you an overview of the ministry and also give you a couple of housekeeping items uh, for the kitchen. JBC has four kitchen teams who serve during the coffee fellowship time on Sundays. This is on a rotating basis, so our teams are up once every four weeks. Uh, team members are asked to provide snacks and 100% juice when possible to serve. We realize that you will not always be there and that there are times when you have other commitments on Sunday mornings. But if you are available, please jump in and help your fellow kitchen team members in the kitchen when possible. There are other times when teams are asked to provide food and to serve. And a few of these times are memorials and uh, funerals, baby and bridal showers and the Christmas concert. Sometimes a team is asked to serve at a potluck or a luncheon. Each team has two leaders. Um, they communicate um, the needs to their teams. They're also there to help with your questions and letting you know where you can best serve your team. There are about 80 people involved in the kitchen ministry and these are mostly women but sometimes we have husbands that help, which is great. Uh, this sounds like we wouldn't need to add any members to this ministry, but not everyone is available every time there's a need and every time their team is asked to provide um, or to serve food. This includes coffee fellowship, and not everybody's available for coffee fellowship. We prepare and serve the pastor's luncheon, and this is a luncheon that is the first Thursday of the month where our pastors get together with area pastors and they have lunch. Another area of service is to outside groups. Um, this is usually a memorial or a funeral, uh, and it may involve setup, serving, cleanup, this one's a wonderful opportunity to minister to the community at large. Um, oftentimes you're, you're serving people you've never met before and um, it's great representation of Jeffrey Bible Church and of Christ. 
You could also help by cleaning the kitchen. Um, this is more of a deep clean. It goes beyond just wiping the counters after Sunday fellowship. Um, this would be probably working by yourself unless you'd like to bring a friend along. With enough of this doing, enough of us doing this, we would only be ser cleaning once every eight weeks or so. And a couple of housekeeping items as promised. Um, we ask that there is no running in the fellowship hall during our coffee fellowship. Um, this is important um, for the safety of everyone involved, young and old. Um, we don't want anyone getting burnt with hot coffee or getting tripped up if they're trying to avoid a runner. Um, also for any group, ministry, or individual who wishes to use the kitchen or the fellowship hall area, we have a form that we would like you to fill out. You can find this form in the office or I can get a form for you. This form will let us know how our kitchen teams can help you. It'll also give us um, information on setup, timing, and it'll also give you information about guidelines for the usage of the kitchen and the fellowship area and also for cleanup. And if you want to leave an item in the kitchen, say for a few days, and be somebody else is picking up that item, we ask that you label that item with either your name or the person's name who's going to be receiving it or picking it up later. Um, just paper and pen in the kitchen if you, um, so you have that available. We're just trying to avoid unlabeled items cluttering the kitchen counters. Um, and then we know who to contact if it's been there for a while. We know who to, who to get a hold of and remind them that their item is ready for pickup in the kitchen. Um, this also includes items in the refrigerator or the freezer. Um, so if you could label those items also. Otherwise, we do go through those, the fridge and the freezer occasionally and it might get thrown out if it's not labeled. The Kitchen Team Ministry is a service ministry, a ministry of hospitality, a ministry of helps. It's serving a cup of coffee in Jesus' name. It says Nana again. And coffee's always better. Fellowship is always better with a cup of coffee in your hand. We minister, minister to our own and to visitors. Um, ministering to visitors, that's usually usually at times when we have memorials or the Christmas cantata. Um, JBC does a wonderful job of providing food and serving. And I wanna thank our kitchen team members and thank you for the opportunity to present the kitchen ministry. Please contact me if you have any questions or if you'd like to be on a kitchen team. Thank you.
call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may It's not very often that we partake of communion with only our immediate family or if you're single by yourself. Uh, yet, you know what? You're, you're never alone because Jesus promises to never leave us or forsake us. 
And though we're not gathered together, we're still the body of Christ. We're scattered throughout the Monadnock region or even for others who may be watching from other parts of the country. But as the song says, we're one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored. We're praying that one day we look forward to that day when we can partake of communion together. And we're taking it together now, even though we're doing it in separate cells as a part of the body of Christ. If you, like me, long for the day when we can come together again, you know, you learn a little bit more of what it must have been for Jesus when he said the following to his disciples when they did their Lord's Supper. In Matthew 26, 29, Jesus said, But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. You know, I imagine Jesus longed to drink it again with his disciples. And I long to partake of communion as a body where I can actually see you and not just have you see me, where all of us can be together, partaking of communion together. In the meantime, we're going to continue to remember the Lord's death, his burial, his resurrection, and his return. So as we partake of communion together this morning, I pray that God will use it to really bring about genuine community within your family and for all of us as a body. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you. I thank you for the blessed privilege we have of this visible symbol to be able to remember what you have done. Thank you so much, Lord, for sending Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for going to the cross for us. Thank you for having your body broken and your blood shed on our behalf. Lord, as we partake of communion now with our families or even by ourselves, if that is the case, Lord, I pray that you would draw near to us and help us to see through this visible symbol your death, your burial, your resurrection, and to understand that one day you will come back. And so, Lord, help to unite us as we partake together now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, the Bible tells us on the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're told that in the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul adds, for as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May God allow us the courage and faithfulness to keep proclaiming his death until he comes. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this precious time that we've had remembering what Jesus Christ did for us. Lord, next week we'll celebrate that in earnest as we celebrate Easter. But thank you, Lord, that for those of us who know you, every day is Easter. May we continually remember your broken body, your shed blood, and your resurrected glory. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply call Longing just to bring something that's of worth 
that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you All about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the faith It's all about you, oh, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless wealth, no one could express how much you This finds each of you doing well. Uh, these are uncharted waters that we're navigating at this time. Uh, if you have any need, please let us as elders or one of the deacons know what some of those needs are, and uh, we'll do whatever we can to assist you during this time. As we go into our time of prayer now, please continue to pray for our country and our leaders, as well as those of other nations. Uh, pray also for the Hopkins family with the loss of Benita's dad, uh, as well as the Mindsma family with the loss of Barb uh, this past Sunday. Uh, so as we do normally, let's just take a moment to pray silently. And then after uh, a time of silent prayer, uh, then we'll all pray together, Lord, speak to me. So would you please pray with me?
Would you pray with me, please? Lord, speak to me. Amen. This morning, we're going to continue our study in the book of Romans, and it's very providential that we come to this passage, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. Before we look at these verses, let's just do a real quick review to see where we've been and where we're headed. Uh, Paul begins with his salutation to the Romans. Like all writers of his day, Paul inserted his name at the beginning of the letter, as well as the people to whom he wrote, which in this case happened to be the Romans. But he puts so much more in those opening verses, as we have seen, by talking about his subject, the person of Jesus Christ, who was in human form, who was the son of David in his humanity, but at the same time he was also the son of God in his deity. He was the God-man, as was demonstrated through his resurrection, which we'll look at again next week when we do our Easter service. And after this salutation, Paul gives them and lets them know how much he loves them. He does that by offering thanks to God for these Romans as he's constantly praying for them, which is a demonstration of his love. I think most of us understand that because we find ourselves praying for those people whom we hold dearest to our lives and hearts. As we saw in our last session in Romans, Paul had three I am statements that he shared with the people there. First, he said that he was under obligation, and he was under obligation to all people. He felt like he was a debtor to share the gospel with everyone. Secondly, he said, he, I am eager He was delighted to share the gospel with all people. And then thirdly, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He had clearly declared his allegiance to Jesus Christ and to the gospel, which demonstrates the righteousness of God, which is the theme of the book of Romans. Now we move into today's text. And I want us to reflect on some things, first of all. Initially, I want us to think about the providence of God. You know, all the leaders in our world and most everyone else who's willing to give it some thought realizes we're not in control. There's a whole lot of things that are not in our control, though we think we have a grasp on everything. In His providence, we're coming to this text today, a text which is going to look at the wrath of God. Now, I don't say that because of COVID-19 pandemic. That's not where the wrath comes in. I say it's providential because today is Palm Sunday. Today is the day when Jesus came into Jerusalem in his triumphal entry. Today is the day that begins the Passion Week. And that is where the wrath of God in us discussing this text comes in. And we'll look at that at the end of the message as well. Because God's wrath was poured out on His Son at the end of that Passion Week with the crucifixion and then eventually His resurrection. So we see a clear tie into this text. As we begin to walk through this section of Romans, we're going to see ourselves in a court scene. The Apostle Paul is the prosecutor for God here. He will be not only the prosecuting attorney who's going to demonstrate that everyone is guilty before a holy God, but he's also going to be the primary witness for that prosecution. You know, back in 1957, there was a movie that was made called Witness for the Prosecution. It's based on an Agatha Christie book, and it's a great movie. And it's one of those movies that at the very end of it, as it wraps up, there is a a sign on the end of the film that says, please do not share the ending with anyone because they, they, they want to catch people as they come through this film. Now, I love mysteries, and, and that was a great story, uh, but Paul doesn't hide anything from anybody as he goes through. He's not coming to a different conclusion at the end. He's going to start off by sharing as God's prosecuting attorney 
as well as its star witness that everybody is going to stand condemned before a holy God in and of themselves. But as we're going to see, and as Romans so clearly demonstrates to us, Paul is going to show us that that God, rather than condemning all of us, sent his son to die on the cross for us. But Paul isn't the only witness, though I said he's the primary witness. I think he's more of a secondary witness because he's going to continually keep taking us back to the Old Testament as we walk through the book of Romans. He's going to demonstrate that all humanity stands guilty before this holy God. But as he does that, he's also going to show us the patience of God. We see his patience in the fact that we've all, all of us, would have been destroyed had God chosen to act and hold us accountable at the moment of our sin. But God has been patient with us. He tells us not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's what God wants. In these verses and the ones that follow, Paul's going to show that all people, beginning with the Gentiles, those pagans who don't know God, then he's going to turn to moral people in chapter 2, and then to religious people in chapters 2 and 3. He's going to show that all of us stand guilty before a holy God. And we are worthy of condemnation because of what we've done. All of us have fallen short of that glory of God. So follow along as we read verses 18 through 23 of chapter 1, and then we'll start walking through them together. Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they're without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You know, Paul begins here by saying, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It seems like there's an abrupt change to go from the gospel of grace to talking about wrath. But if you'll notice in verse 17, once again, the word revealed is in there. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And then in verse 18, he continues with that thought, for the wrath of God is revealed. Uh, they're not contrasting in the sense of disagreement, but they do parallel each other in showing both sides of the same coin. John Whitmer said in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, they are contrasting parallel passages in the sense that you have God's wrath, God's righteousness, and you have to understand both to be able to see the gospel of grace. J. Vernon McGee said, If you want to know what salvation really is, you have to know how bad sin is. James Stifler, in his commentary, said, The gospel would be nothing if men were not guilty and in need of the rescue which the gospel alone can afford. The gospel alone reveals the means of salvation. For everywhere else there is no revelation except of wrath. The 18th verse about wrath gives significance to the preceding two about grace. Sin is the measure of salvation. Only they know what, is the, what it is to be saved who know what it is to be lost. We have to understand our lostness to be able to understand salvation. Jesus said, He who is forgiven much, Loves much. I want y'all to know something. 
I am in love with Jesus Christ. I'm not in love with Jesus because I'm some super spiritual person. I'm in love with Jesus because I've been forgiven much. And I continue to be forgiven much. He who is forgiven much loves much. I know the wickedness in my own heart. Not back before I became a Christian, but today. I know my selfishness. I know my self-centeredness. And I know how Jesus meets me and forgives me even today. And so he who is forgiven much loves much, as Jesus said. And we have to understand our lostness to be able to truly comprehend how amazing God's grace is in giving us salvation. So let's look at this wrath as revealed in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. He said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. You know, you can do an entire sermon on those few words. But we're not going to do a whole sermon on that. We're going to cover all these verses. The only thing I want to focus on here is the tense of the verb. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. He doesn't say the wrath of God was revealed from heaven back in the Old Testament. Because there's a whole lot of people that want to make God into two different people. There's a God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament. But it's the same God everywhere. His wrath is revealed in the Old Testament. His wrath is revealed in the New Testament. His grace is revealed in the Old Testament. His grace is revealed in the New Testament. It's the same God everywhere. His wrath is revealed. And there's many places where we can see that wrath having been revealed. I want to read just a couple of texts to us to talk a little bit more about this wrath. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, verse 6 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon, listen, the sons of disobedience. These are people who have rebelled against God and they are justly receiving His wrath. Colossians 3, 6 says, For it is because of these things the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. We can't ignore the fact that God is a wrathful God. Now, let's define this because I think that's very important. Wrath is His displeasure with sin and evil. Kenneth Weiss, in his word studies in the Greek New Testament, writes, The Greek term used here is the word orge, which is a reference to God's personal emotion with regard to sin. It represents God's abhorrence and hatred of sin. Orge is not God's punishment of sin, it's His attitude towards sin. If somebody seeks to be righteous, they have to hate sin. You can't love sin and be righteous at the same time. God is always righteous, and because of that, He is wrathful toward anything that removes any of us from that righteousness. Often when we think of wrath, wrath we think of someone flying off the handle. God doesn't fly off the handle. He's in complete control. He does, however, hate all sin and all evil. Which takes us to why that wrath is revealed. The text says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's the reason that wrath is there. It's because of sin. Ungodliness. It's a lack of reverence toward God. It's impiety. It's a denial or opposition to the character of God. Unrighteousness is really immorality. It's a denial of God's rule in our lives. It's a lack of righteousness in our relationship, not only with God, but also with other people. And notice the response that comes out of this. It's against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, notice, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I put the word response in there for that because I want us to think of it from this perspective. People are not reacting in this manner. This is a response. This is a well thought through understanding on people's part. 
We hold down the truth. I'm going to get back to that in a few minutes here. This idea of holding down the truth. Look at verse 19 and 20 as we continue through this. He says, Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So you have the reason, which is sin, and then you have the response, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. How does that happen? First, you have an awareness of man. Our conscience. That's verse 19. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. On the inside, all people know about who God is. And then it says, and He made it evident to them for since the creation. So we're going to talk about creation and we're going to talk about conscience for just a minute. When it talks about our conscience, one of the verses that comes to my mind is Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. These verses tell us that there's no place that we can go from God's Spirit. Where can I go from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I go into the depths of Sheol, you're there. If I make my place in the wings of the dawn, if I go into the deepest sea, even there your hand will lead me. Even there you're there. Darkness isn't dark to you. God is everywhere and our conscience knows that. There's no place we can go where people don't have an awareness of who God is. That's natural because it's within our conscience. But secondly, it's also there because of creation. You know, I think of, uh, of Helen Keller. You remember Helen Keller, the, the lady who had an amazing story who was, as a result of a very young, I believe, childhood accident uh, in infancy, she was, or she was either born deaf and blind, but uh, she eventually began to understand as a result of what Annie Sullivan shared with her. When somebody shared the gospel with Helen Keller, her words were, I've always known about him, I just didn't know his name. There's something within us that tells us there's a God. And there's things all around us that reveal to us that there's a God. We see His idea of creation, His testimony through creation in Psalm 19. It's one of the greatest places to look to that. It looks at general revelation in the creation, and then it looks at specific revelation in His Word. Verses 1 through 4 of Psalm 19 say, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterance to the ends of the world. Everywhere you go, there is a testimony to the fact that there is a God. There's a story that's told about Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, where one of his officers and some others were talking. They were talking about religion, and somebody made the comment that I'm going to start a religion, to which supposedly Napoleon said, if you want to start a religion... Look up to the skies, you see all those stars, you put something like that in place and you have every right to start a religion. You look at creation and you see there has to be a creator. And then he goes from there to, in verses 7 through 11 initially, with uh, what we call special revelation, talking about his word. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, they are righteous altogether. They're more desirable than gold, yes, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. That which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. It's evident. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, 
and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they're without excuse. We not only have an awareness of God as man, but secondly, we have the attributes of God that have been revealed. You know, there's a paradox here as you read this text. Verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen. Think through that paradox. They're invisible, but they're clearly seen. They are so evident that the invisible things of God are clearly seen by people. But people choose to reject that. <clears throat> What's clearly seen? He tells us His eternal power and divine nature. His deity. You can't look at the complexity of the universe and say it just happened. And you know, the deeper we dig into the smallness of the universe, when we go into the atoms, and then you start looking at the nucleus and the electrons and the protons, and they keep going deeper and deeper in, and they, they keep finding more and more complexity. And there's no explanation for that. It can't just happen. You have God's power, which is eternal, because He is eternal. And then you have His divine nature. He is distinct from everything else, because He is the uncreated Creator, whereas everything else is created. All these signs give us a declaration to man. God is there, and deep within, man knows it. You know, you have to become, quote-unquote, educated to, uh, to become an atheist. It's not natural. It's unnatural. Because everywhere you go, people have a religion, and they understand that there's a God. They may not understand Him truly, but we see it everywhere. And thirdly, it tells us here that they're without excuse. People don't have an excuse. No one will have an excuse before God. All will be justly judged by a just judge. You know, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, we have the story of the sheep and the goats. Now, that story gets often used in today's world of us helping people and so forth and so on. The text begins with, When the Son of Man comes and all the holy angels with him. We're talking about the return of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're talking at a time that, biblically speaking, is at the end of the millennium. And you see, how did people respond to the Jews at that time period? Excuse me, at the end of the tribulation. And uh, how did they respond to those brothers of Jesus Christ? And you remember when he talks about the goats in there? You have this statement... Lord, when, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When were you in jail and we came to you? They came up with excuses, but they were still rightly held responsible because people are accountable before God. All of us have to give an account before Him. Remember a number of years ago, Karen and I were driving through Vermont on our way to New York, and we got pulled over. Got pulled over for doing a 37 and a 25. Uh, Karen immediately asked me as I got pulled over, she said, do you have a headlight out? And I said, I don't think so. I don't know what's going on. Because we thought the speed limit was 35. Every town we had come into on this road, the speed limit was 35. We hit this one town, got pulled over. Older officer, pretty rude, pretty arrogant, kind of looked at us, said, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, no, sir said, you're doing a 37 and a 25. I need to see your driver's license, proof of registration. Gave him the stuff. He just sit right there. I'll be right back. Walked away and just looked at Karen. She's looking at me going, wow, what just happened? Came in there, basically handed our stuff, have a good day, and took off. Now, I didn't see the sign. I went by previous learning, too, as I've been driving. It's 35 every time in every other town except this one on this road. Guess what? I still paid the fine. I had to pay the ticket. I, I couldn't plead ignorance. I didn't see the sign. I couldn't plead, hey, everything else was 35. It was 25 here. It was posted. We missed it. I'm still responsible. Everybody will give an account before God. God will not be like this police officer. He will not be callous. He will not be cold. 
but He will be truthful and He will judge rightly. So how does all this tie in here? It says, go back to verse 18. It says, these people try to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, if you look here, I have a little jar here, this water jar, and it's got a little ball in there. It's actually, it's the earth. And let's pretend this is the truth of God. The truth of God is always visible. It wants to be there. The only way this thing is going to go down is if somebody suppresses it. The moment I stop suppressing it, it comes right back up. God's truth is always going to come up. The only way that you keep God's truth away, you hold it down. You try to suppress it. And how do people suppress it? They suppress it in unrighteousness. They feel like they can do it their way rather than God's way. And so we end up suppressing His truth. But it doesn't matter if people suppress it or don't. They're still one day going to give an account before an infinitely holy God for the things that He has revealed to us. So let's continue in Romans now. In verses uh, 21 through 23, he's going to talk about how people will try to replace God with man-made religion. Verse 21, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Let's look at man's actions in verse 21. First of all, there's a lack of honor. They did not honor Him as God. There's a lack of honor there. You know, Psalm 115, verses 1-8 through say the following, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to Your name give glory. Because of Your loving kindness, because of Your truth, why should the nations say, Where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He looks down. He does whatever He pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. Now contrast that with what he says in the last verse of this psalm. But as for us, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forever. Praise the Lord. You know, let's not be like those pagans. Let us honor God in the things that we do. Here he says, even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. I think one of the one of the characteristics of the culture in which we find ourselves living oftentimes is just thanklessness. I mean, everybody thinks they're entitled to everything and nobody gives thanks for a whole lot of stuff. Remember the story that Jesus tells? It's not that He tells, but there was an experience where ten lepers came and Jesus healed all ten of them. They all left and they all walked away. And as they were going, one of them who realized he'd been cleansed turns back and he offers thanks. And the Bible tells us that he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, where are the other nine? Is the only one who would return and give thanks? Is this uh, non-Israelite? I think one of the things that concerns me about myself at times is just lack of gratitude. And I think it's something that we should all work on. You know, G.K. Chesterton in his, in his book Orthodoxy tells about, you know, people giving gifts to others and people are excited that they got a pair of stockings for Christmas. To which he asks, should I not be excited and thankful that God gave me legs to put into those stockings? Who do I thank for those legs? Who do I thank for the things that I have? We need to be a grateful people. We need to always give thanks. 
Give thanks when you get up in the morning. You know, many people are not going to get up in some mornings. Most who do will not give thanks when they do. Let's be different than that. You know, I found myself thinking over the past month or so, uh, I've lost a little bit of money uh, the past few weeks, the past month or so. I'm assuming I'm in the same boat with a whole lot of people. I found myself thanking God as I've looked at how much money I lost that I had that much amount of money to lose in the first place. And then I find myself thanking God that I wasn't a multi-billionaire having lost multi-billions during that time. I mean, everything that we experience, we can find a way to turn into gratitude if we choose to do so. We can learn to be a thankful people. It's possible to give thanks in everything. <clears throat> you know, uh, as I share this, my heart has been broken throughout this week because of the passing of Barb Mindsma. I have thanked God that my heart is broken because there's a whole lot of people who passed away today that I knew nothing about and it doesn't even touch my heart. The reason that my heart is broken is because I genuinely cared about Barb, as did my wife Karen, as did many of us. Let's learn to be a thankful people. And thirdly, he said here in verse 21, he said they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. There's a lack of light there. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 through 24, it says the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. The idea there is that the eye allows us to determine the way that it's being used there. It's our values. What are the things that we value in this life? If the things that you value end up being darkness and you think it's light, how great is that darkness? I mean, there's a whole lot of people that value just material things and nothing else. They'll sacrifice people, they'll sacrifice relationships, they'll sacrifice family to pursue things. How great is that darkness at the end of life? I mean, I remember of a professional coach a number of years ago who, once he became the head coach of a particular team out of college into the pros, he divorced his wife. And his comment was, and this was written in the paper so I can share it, he said, you know, I needed my wife on the college level for PR reasons. I just don't have time for a family. I just, my whole life is this game. And I find myself thinking, going, Man, I hope trophies and rings can comfort you on your deathbed because unless you have a change in your attitude and life, there's not going to be a whole lot of people there comforting you. How great is the darkness that people have when they think it's the light? I mean, think of Adolf Hitler. Think of the Nazis in Germany. They really thought they had the light. And look at the darkness that was there. So let's make sure that we're walking in the light that God has. Then the last two verses for us today, uh, we'll look at man's alterations. Verses 22 and 23. Look how man changes things. He alters stuff. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchange wisdom for folly. You know, the psalmist said in Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The difference between the psalmist and today is that the fool said it in his heart. And today people stand on stage in front of college students day in and day out, mocking this God. The fool proclaims it from universities and colleges and television and everywhere else. And we exchange wisdom for folly. In Psalm 10 verse 4 it says the following the wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him all his thoughts are there is no God 
And this whole idea of no God keeps coming back to the area of wickedness. And then in verse 23, it says, They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. They exchanged God's glory for idolatry. Notice that we're digressing, not progressing here. We, we work backwards, not forward. You know, at the start of the Bible, you have man in the garden, and he is in intimate relationship with God. And we have digressed from there. We have not gotten better. As we're going to see near the end of the chapter 1 of Romans, we start inventing ways to sin. It says they're inventors of evil. We just keep regressing, not progressing. And it starts with man, then it goes to birds and animals, and we end up with crawling creatures, snakes. So you could say it's devolution, not evolution. We haven't gone forward, we've gone backwards as you really examine humanity. We're not moving up, we're moving down. It's an area of idolatry. I, I received this, I saw this on Facebook from a friend of mine. Some of y'all have probably seen it too. It said the following, it says, In three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I'll shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I'll shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I'll shut down theaters. You want to worship money? I'll shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me? I'll make it where you can't go to church. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, will heal their land. What we need is for people to repent. What we need is for people to come back to God. How do we turn away from the wrath of God? We turn away from the wrath of God by going to God, who bore that wrath for us. And I want to conclude with that. First, the wrath of God with His providence. We trust His sovereignty and we trust His timing. As I said at the beginning, the wrath of God coming on this time, this is the verse, these are the verses that we're scheduled to cover today. And those verses lead us into the Passion Week. It was there that God poured out His wrath in its fullness upon His Son because of His love for you and His love for me. It's a message of grace, God's incredible, amazing grace, that He would bear the wrath of God on our behalf. And so we have to look at the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, who bore that sin. You know, I came in yesterday and uh, Maria, our secretary, said, there's a message here and... Uh, I think it's somebody who knows you. And so I, I listened to that message and I, I want to share what this person shared with me. You'll have a picture on, your, uh, on the PowerPoint of this man. His name is Dr. Hap Struthers. Uh, Hap, I think, is 91 or 92 at this point. When I first met him back in the 90s, he was a professor at Columbia Bible College and Seminary. Uh, he left there to do an extension of Columbia Bible College and Seminary, which is Columbia International University now in Norfolk, Virginia. When he got there, it was easier to start a new seminary because of all the paperwork and red tape. So he started Faith Bible College there. Uh, he used to be on the board with FCA when I first met him in South Carolina. I admired him. I loved him then. I still love him now. And Hap called on Monday to share with me. And this is what he said. He said, Foad, I'm just calling to let you know that what I prayed for you today. He said, I wanted to text it to you, but I didn't have your cell phone number. Uh, he said, I prayed, this is what I prayed for you today as I pray every day for you. Hap has prayed for me for the, at least every day for the last 25 years, at least. Just blows my mind. 
You know, uh, he, he's the only man I've personally ever been around that every time I've left his presence, I've left in tears going, God, please make me more like him. So I started listening to the message. And when I heard that it was Hap's voice, I teared up. And when I heard him say that he's praying for me as he does every day, I teared up more. And then when he shared with me what he prayed for me on Monday, I teared up even more. Here's what he prayed for me. He said, Phoad in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 35, and I'm going to read that text to you. It says, Then he shall remove all its fat, talking about the priest, just as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the priest shall offer them up in smoke on the altar, and the offerings by fire to the Lord. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him in regard to his sin, which he has committed, and he will be forgiven. Hap said that a person's sin was passed on to that animal, and that person was forgiven. There was reconciliation. He then added that the Hebrew word for compassion, and he's a Hebrew scholar, uh, has not only the idea of forgiveness, but also of a hug. You've got the hands on there. He said, I prayed for you today, Foad, and want you to know that God likes you. He cares about you. He cares for you. He hugs you. He's taking care of you and protecting you because He really likes you. And, and I just as simple as that was, I just wept. I just needed to hear that. And... Uh, God's able to do that because of Jesus Christ and what Jesus did. God is able to reach out and put His arms around me and hug me and hug you because of what Jesus did. Because Jesus bore the wrath of God so that you and I do not have to bear His wrath. So can I ask you as we wrap up, have you trusted this Jesus? Or are you going to have to face the wrath of God all on your own? Jesus bore the wrath of God on your behalf and on my behalf. If you've never trusted him, why not do so today? If you have trusted him, let's make a commitment to keep sharing that message with others, to let people know that God loves them, that God has forgiven them, if they will trust him that God really likes them. God loves them, loves them so much that he would sacrifice his son on their behalf. Let's make a commitment to that message. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I, I thank you uh, just for who you are. I thank you for this, this amazing text, once again, from the pen of the Apostle Paul, but really from the heart of God and by the Holy Spirit that you have entrusted to us. Father, I thank you that there is wrath because you're a holy God and you hate sin and you have to punish sin. It is not compatible with who you are. And I thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ has borne our sin. And I pray, Father, for any who have not trusted him, who may be hearing this, watching this, I pray, Father, that you would help them to see what Jesus Christ has done for them and that you would draw them to yourself. And Father, for those of us who have trusted you, I pray that you would help us to keep coming back to you day in and day out, to learn to be thankful, to learn to be grateful, Lord, to learn to be a people who honor you, who walk in the light, to be a people, Lord, who don't exchange your truth for a lie, who don't worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. God, help us to focus on you and help us to share that message with others. Lord, we just commit all this to you, and we thank you for your amazing, amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you join us now as uh, we sing a song together?
Thank y'all for watching the service today. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Enjoy your time with your family and we'll see you next week. God bless you.